for the possession. You're going to have to fight for the land. You're going to have to fight for the fruit. You're going to have to fight for the milk and honey because it's yours. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I said somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And look at what, look at what they said. They, they, they said in verse 9, go back to verse 9. In verse 9, they said, these people, these giants that are in the land, he said they're bread for us. In other words, J Joshua and Caleb, <clears throat> they were ready to fight. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were ready to fight. They were ready to go after them. They were ready to conquer the promised land. And, and notice what the scripture says. He says, even though they're giants, we've seen them. They're giants. You got nine feet, nine feet. Of, of folks walking around but look at what he says their defense the defense that these giants have they're gone from them why because God is with us do you not know that God is with you do you not know that God is on your side do you not know that you are a child of God and if God be for us it is more than the whole world against us if you know that God is on your side put your hands together and give God a praise if you know that God is on your side, put your hands together and give God a praise. Look at what they said. The Lord is with us. Their defense is gone. They're bread for us. And, and, and the scripture says, uh, don't fear them. I know they're giants in the land. I know they're bigger than us. I know they're taller than us. I know they are warlike people. But Joshua and Caleb, the way they looked at it, they looked at it like God is with us. And because God is with us, I don't care, I don't care what, I, I don't care what's happening because if God is with us, we are eventually going to get the victory. Somebody, somebody shout hallelujah. I said somebody shout hallelujah. And God had to take them through the wilderness. God had to take them through a dry place. And I believe that every one of us, because the children of Israel in the wilderness are some, are, it's a picture or an indication of us that God will bring us to a wilderness experience. He will bring us to a dry place. He will bring us to a place where nothing is growing, nothing is happening, there's no water there. He's, he's bringing us to this place so that because there are certain things that you can only experience with God in a dry place. In other words, when all of your help has gone, when all of your assistance is gone, when all, when all of the, all of the, all of the people that helped you, now it's gone. Now you have to get to a place where you are totally dependent upon God. This is where the children of Israel were. They were out in the wilderness and they had to depend upon God for everything. They had to depend upon God for food. They had to depend upon God for shade. They had to depend upon God for protection. They had to depend upon God for their daily necessities. I wonder if there's anybody in here that has a testimony when everything was gone for you. God still provided for you. I wonder if there's anybody in here that has a testimony. I don't know how it's taken place, but God is still putting food on the table. I don't know how the bills are getting paid because there's more money going out than there is coming in, but the bills are being paid. My credit score is going up. I don't know how it's happening. All I know is that I'm in a desert place and God is still providing. All I know is that I'm in a dry place and I can say like Paul, hallelujah, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I want to tell you something, this is the turning point for God. Because when God saw the rebellion of the ten spies, and when he saw the rebellion of the congregation of Israel, he said, that's it. He said, that's it. I'm, I'm fed up. In fact, he told Moses, he said, I'm going to destroy everybody, and I'll raise up a nation unto you out of your loins. He said, I'm tired of these people. It's only been two years, but I'm tired of these people. I've shown them miracle after miracle after miracle, and they still refuse to believe me. I've provided for them every day a miracle, manna, angel's food that's dropping on the ground, and yet they're still complaining. And God says, I'm finished. That's it. God says, I'm through with them. And Moses had to intercede to God in order for God not to destroy the entire nation. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. 
even though they complained against Moses, even though his own family complained against him, his own sister complained against him because of the black woman that he married, Zipporah. She complained against Moses. Aaron complained against Moses. So he had his own family complaining against him, and then he had the entire congregation complaining against Moses. It was almost, it was almost as if the people said, forget about Moses. We're going to go back into Egypt. We want somebody. We're going to raise up leaders to take us back into Egypt. Can you imagine the pressure that Moses was under? Can, can, can you imagine Moses being a leader of over two million people in the wilderness and you got over two million people complaining about your leadership skills, complaining about how God is directing you and now they want to go back into Egypt? Moses has to fall on his face. He has to fall on his knees and he has to go to God in order for God not to destroy the nation that he brought them out of. He he said, Lord, the people in the promised land have already heard. Your reputation has already preceded. It's, it's already preceded. The people have already heard about what you're going to do. And so Moses actually stands as an intercessor on behalf of all these disobedient, rebellious folk that want to go back into Egypt. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I said somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And, and so look at what he says right here. Let me, let me just read in verse 15. He says, now if thou kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land, which he swear unto them, therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. This is where the intercession comes in. Now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great, according as thou hast spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Look, listen to what he says in verse 19. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people, according unto the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt, even until now. Good God of mercy. Moses stands as an intercessor on behalf of the entire nation. And, and he says he, he falls upon the character of God, which is abundant in mercy. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And because, uh, because he, he says, uh, I want you to pardon them, Lord, and Moses lays out his, old, his entire argument. Deacon Jr., in Numbers chapter 14, uh, verse 20, all of a sudden, God starts to change his mind. Look, he, at one second, he was getting ready to destroy all of them. And now look at what he says. And the Lord said, I have pardoned. In other words, I have forgiven them according to thy word, Moses. I'm going to forgive them. Look at what it says in verse 21. But as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. In other words, God says, even though they're disobedient and even, even though I'm going to pardon their iniquity my glory is still going to be revealed somebody ought to shout hallelujah he says my glory is going to be revealed look at what he says in verse 22 he says all these men which have saw my glory they have seen my glory and they have seen my miracles which I did in Egypt there were miracles that God did in Egypt you remember the 10 plagues all of those were miracles that God did in Egypt and the generation that came out of Egypt into the wilderness they saw it not only did they see the miracles in Egypt but they saw the miracles in the wilderness they saw the Red Sea open they saw they saw their master coming after them and then they saw God close the Red Sea and their master drown they saw God when he told Moses put a tree in that water and the bitter waters were made sweet they, they saw God when he told Moses speak 
to the rock and all of a sudden water came gushing out of the rock. They, they saw God do all of these miracles in the wilderness and, and yet they still did not believe. The question has to come to the church. God has done something in your life. Is he not the same yesterday, today and forevermore? Just because we hit a little bit of a rough spot it does not mean that God has forgotten about you or God is not still in the miracle working business God is still in the miracle working business I wonder if anybody has to pull on their faith to say that faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen for by it the elders obtained a good report through faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made by the things which do appear by faith it is impossible to please God it is impossible to please God without faith somebody ought to shout hallelujah God is pulling on our faith this morning he's pulling on our faith this morning he's pulling on our faith this morning he's pulling on our faith this morning because sometimes God even in a pandemic it doesn't matter who the president is God can still provide for you even in a pandemic God can still provide for you even in rough times God can still provide for you even without a job there's a million ways that God can still provide for us somebody ought to shout hallelujah I said somebody ought to shout hallelujah it doesn't matter who's at the local level doesn't matter who's at the state level doesn't matter who's at the federal level because we are a child of God God is duty bound and he's obligated to take care of his own can you shout hallelujah I said can you shout hallelujah and so look at what he says. He says, all of these men, that there should have been a level of maturity based upon the miracles, based upon the signs that they saw in Egypt, that they saw in the wilderness. They've only been in the wilderness two years. And yet, when they wanted flesh to eat, God caused quails to fly 250 miles from the sea inland, right where they are. And all they had to do was reach out their hand and grab it. They didn't have to jump to grab it. When quails are low-flying creatures, all they had to do was reach out their hand and get it. They saw all of these miracles, and yet, they failed to believe God just because of the perception and just because of the evil report of these 10 spies, somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And so what God says, uh, because they have tempted me these 10 times, and there were, we can point out, 10 different temptations that happened to the children of Israel over this two-year period. 10 temptations that they've tempted God over this two-year period. And notice what he says, they have not hearkened unto my voice. Numbers chapter 14, 23 says, surely they shall not see the land. Listen to what God is saying. Because these men complained, because they rebelled against my word, because they did not have faith when they saw the miracles. That's why the scripture says the word that was preached unto them, it did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Be, be, because because uh, they said, listen to what he says, they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. And notice what God said. Look how specific God is. God says, neither shall any of them that provoke me Neither shall they see it. Do you not know that all of a sudden, right then and there, in the rest of this chapter, God says anybody from 20 years old and upward is not going to go into the promised land. Think about that. 20 years old and upward, they're not going to go into the promised land. God said only Joshua and only Caleb. And that brings me to verse 24. This is what I want to talk about. Look at what it says in Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Look at what it says right here in verse 24. Verse 24, he says, but my servant, my servant Caleb, he says he's got another spirit. Think about that right there because the dichotomy is that we have two different entities residing in the same house. We've got our old our old Adamic nature in which we were born with that's in this house and then we have our new spirit filled nature that when you got filled with the spirit of God now you got another nature inside of you and now these two are wrestling 
this is the dichotomy that we are in right now. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. That's why Paul says the good that I would, that do I not. But what I hate that I do. If I do that which I would not, it is no longer I that do it, but is the sin that dwelleth in me. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. In other words, there's an importance here that, that, that would, I want to try to bring to the forefront here because the scripture says, Caleb has another spirit. Do you not know that the scripture says that it is the spirit of a man that will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear in other words, when your spirit is strong, you can, you can sustain your infirmity. You can fight that infirmity. But when your spirit is wounded, it's very difficult to go through that. I don't know if anybody has ever been hurt. I'm talking about hurt in your spirit. I'm talking about a parent saying something that is totally, totally different damaging and and totally totally just frustrating to you i don't know if you've ever admired somebody and all of a sudden the conversation that they had with you it just it just like a like a sword just stabbed in you i'm talking about when they say you can't do nothing and you can't be nothing see this is why i want to talk about caleb because it was caleb and joshua i want you to notice something the 12 spies they come they're all related because they come from the same lineage of abraham of isaac Isaac and of Jacob but can I tell you what Jacob can I tell you what Joshua and Caleb had to do although they came from the same stock as the rest of the people there comes a time where you have to cut off your cut buddies you have to cut off people in your family because they don't believe and they don't see things like you see it somebody ought to shout hallelujah and the reason why I say that is because sometimes when God is telling you and showing you things that you to do some people will say well you can't do that because you don't have this that or the other. Some people say, well, you can't do that because you don't have this experience. But how many know when God says you can do it, you don't need no experience. You don't need no degree. You don't need nothing. That All you got to do is have a faith in God and you will get it done. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I said somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Look at what the scripture says. He says, my servant. I like that. God is saying, my servant. My, my servant, my, my servant Caleb. Look at what the scripture says. Caleb had a, another spirit. And what concerns me today, what concerns me today in our Western culture is that we spend too much time on our flesh than we do our spirit man. I can't get no help in here. We, we spend so much time pampering our flesh and dressing our flesh, and doing everything for our flesh, but yet we do nothing in terms of feeding our spiritual mind. And, and how, can, how can we expect to be living better when we spend more time pampering our flesh than we do caring for our spirits? Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Sister Owens isn't here right now. I think she might have went to the church. But one day, uh, a, a couple of months ago, says Sister Moni, she sent me to Wegmans. She sent me to Wegmans to get some food. This is on a Sunday. And so I don't, I don't like going shopping, but I went to Wegmans. And, and as I'm going to Wegmans, as I, as I get all the things that she had listed out, I get on the line. And when I get on the line, the cashier says, uh, you Bishop Owens? I said, yes, ma'am. She says, you know, I love your service. I, I watch you, I watch you on, on YouTube. I've I seen you on Facebook. She said, I really enjoy the service. Well, I said, well, thank God. Thank God. And, and she says, um, I said, Are, how long have you been watching? She said, like over a year and a half. I said, really? A year and a half? I said, that's kind of long. I said, do you belong to some church? She says, no, I don't belong to your church. She said, look, I love the praise and worship. I, I love, I love, most of all, I love the word of God that is being preached. But she said, the reason why I, I can't I can't come all the time because she said your services are too long. I said, really? You think you think the services are too long? But but while she was saying that, Sister April, I, I remember this because Sister April was doing something. She she had these beautiful braids in her hair, these micro braids. And, and I said, wow, those are some nice braids you got in your hair. I said, how long did it take you to put those braids in your hair? She said, it took me eight and a half hours to put those micro braids 
ways in my hair. And I said, excuse me, sis. I said, do you mean to tell me you can sit in somebody's chair with somebody else's hair in your head? You can sit in a chair for eight and a half hours and you can't sit in the house of the Lord for two and a half hours knowing that God, he is the God of God. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. He is the one that gives us life, help, and strength. You're going to tell me you're going to spend all of that time by putting somebody else's hair in your head and you can't spend two and a half hours in a church service? The devil is a liar. We spend way too much time pampering our flesh and we do nothing about the spiritual man on the inside. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I said somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And so as we look at this verse right here, Numbers chapter 14, 24, it says Caleb, he had uh, another spirit. And can I talk to you about having this, this uh, another spirit? In, in fact, Nicodemus came to Jesus and, and he said, how shall a man be born again? Shall he enter the second time into his mother's womb? And you know, Jesus had to tell them that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, I say unto you, that you must be born again. I'm, I'm talking about the spirit because he said the spirit, the wind bloweth where it listeth. You can hear the sound thereof, but you don't know where it's going and you don't know where it's come from. He says, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. Somebody shout the spirit. That's why God wants us to spend more time working on our spirit. The Bible says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We got to spend more time feeding and and building our spirit. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I said somebody ought to shout hallelujah. So here, here we are talking about this man, Caleb, because the scripture says Caleb had a different spirit. He had another spirit than the rest of those 10, of the rest of those 10, those 10 spies. And what I want to bring to the forefront here in verse 24, they were actually in this place called Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea. And Kadesh means holiness. And Barnea means the height. And so what Kadesh Barnea, it literally means the height of holiness. And can I just tell you that the place that they're in is a place of holiness. And you know, the scripture is still right. My mother, when we used to go to Bible school, my mother's favorite scripture used to be holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Can I tell you holiness is still right? Can I tell you we still need to preach holiness in the church? Can I tell you when you're at Kadesh Barnea, you are at the height of holiness. Don't let nobody bring you down from your holiness. Don't let anybody bring you down from the standards that we grew up on. Hallelujah. Ain't a name. We can't go back to going back and shacking up and not getting married and having all kind of sex without marriage. The devil is a liar. The Bible says holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Can you shout hallelujah? I said can you shout hallelujah? Look at what the scripture says. The scripture says when you follow Caleb, you realize that Caleb represents the tribe of Judah. And, and Judah means may Jehovah be praised. Can you shout hallelujah? And that's why that, that gives us an indication as to why Caleb was different is because he came from a tribe. He, came, he comes from a lineage that will always open up their mouth and give God praise and give God glory under any circumstance or under any situation can you shout hallelujah and can I tell you that the name Caleb the name Caleb it literally means raging with canine madness that's what the name Caleb means it means raging with canine madness and I said well well what does that mean I, I don't understand that but 
but sister, I can remember when I was teaching Bible study one night uh, and nobody was home. I think my mother was at my sister's house. Danielle was out and Sheila was at work. But after Bible study, I, I, after Bible study, I came upstairs and, and uh, Danielle's mutt, oh, I'm sorry, Danielle's dog Snickers, he was in the room and he started barking as soon as I came upstairs. So I had to open up the door. You know, he's a dog that needs a lot of attention. To me, he's just a lap dog. He's just a mutt. But, but he needed a lot of attention. He's the kind of dog that when he's hungry, he'll start go kicking his tray around, kicking his food tray around. When, when he wants to go outside for a walk, he'll start nipping at your feet. He'll get the leash and bring it to you. He's that kind of mutt. But he started barking. He started barking. So I fed him and then I brought him out. And then when he came back inside, what I did, I said, you know what? I, I, I want to play with you. We're the only ones in the house. So I took a dish. I took a dish rag. I, I took a dish towel. I took a dish towel from the kitchen. And what I started doing, I started popping them in his head. I popped them in his head once. I popped them in his head twice. I popped them in his head the third time. And then all of a sudden, when I get ready to pop them the fourth time, what he did was he jumped. He jumped. And all of a sudden, his teeth landed on the dish, the dish towel. And he would not let it go. And all of a sudden, I started swinging him around. And then I realized, I got the revelation. That's what Caleb's name means. It, it means it means a madness of canine. It means raging with canine madness. In other words, this little mutt that I could kick all over the place, he got so angry that he locked his jaw into the towel and I started swinging the towel around and he would not let it go. That's the type of spirit that Caleb had. Caleb had that spirit that once he got God's word in his heart, he could not let it go. He got locked jaw and he started he says I don't care what anybody says this is what God says you know that's the type of spirit that we've got to have we've got to have the spirit that will defy what other people say we can't do what other people say we're not qualified to do what other people say we don't have the experience to do but we've got to be like that dog Snickers and just lock our jaws around the word of God and don't let it go somebody ought to shout hallelujah I said, somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Th this is this little dog, not a pit bull, not a Rottweiler. He would not let it go. Even when I told him to let it go, he defied me. He would not let it go. So I let the towel go. And he kept that towel in his mouth for the next five or ten minutes, just taking it just all around, all around the living room, all around the dining room. He would not let it go like he was upset with me. And then all of a sudden, I got the revelation this is what the name Caleb means. It means that uh, it, it means that you get your jaws wrapped around what God says and you do not let it go. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. You do not let it go. All the naysayers that are saying it can't be done. All the naysayers are saying that it's giants in the land. All the naysayers that try to have, because they got fear, they try to impose their fear upon you. We can't allow that to happen. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. That, that's what the name Caleb means. Can you shout hallelujah? That, can you shout hallelujah? Uh, the scripture says that Caleb's father's name was Yehunah. Yehunah, and the name Yehunah, it literally means it shall be prepared. Just like Joshua was the son of Nun. When you start to do your homework upon Caleb, it says Caleb the son of Jephunah. And the name Jephunah means that it shall be prepared. Can you shout hallelujah? And really that's a prophetic utterance. That's a prophetic utterance that literally says what God has said. It's, it's going to come to pass. Can you put your hands together and give God praise? This is a prophecy of statement. This is a prophecy of statement because this is, this is, who, this is who Caleb come from. His father's name means it shall be prepared. Can I tell you, when you come from a father that has integrity, do you not know that that integrity will follow you. If you follow God, it will follow you. And sometimes we need to check who we're hanging out with. Sometimes we can determine what your next three years are going to be like based upon the friends you hang out with. I can't get no help in here. Sometimes we can determine what your destiny is going to be based upon who you keep company with. Look at what the scripture says. The scripture says his, his father's name means it shall be prepared. And 
In other words, God has prepared some things for you. God has positioned some things for you. God has purposed some things for you. Can you shout hallelujah? I said, can you shout hallelujah? And so here, Joshua and his father, they come from the tribe of Judah. And Judah means praise. And there's this word called praise called Yadah. And it literally means that you lift up your hands and you give God glory. And that's literally what Caleb means. That's literally what him and his father, when they come from this tribe of Judah, it literally means that they're lifting up their hands with praise. And can I tell you what this word means? You see, this particular word this particular word yada y-a-d-a-h yada it literally means that you lift up your hands with praise in other words it's different than just worship because you can worship and not anybody know that you're worshiping when you worship look at what happened with John on the Isle of Patmos he was laid prostrate not making a noise but he was worshiping but this this instance this word yada it literally means that you're lifting up your hands and something is coming out of your mouth which means that when you you die it means that there's an audio component and that there's a video component the audio means that word is coming out of your mouth the video component is that you lift up your hand I'm not talking about a baseball game or a basketball game because Stephen Curry hit a three but I'm talking about when God makes a way out of no way some of us just lift up our hands because what God has done I I believe there's some people in here and some people that are listening you know that if it had not been for the Lord that was on your side we would have died in the wilderness we just gotta lift up our hands that's why the Bible says lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord somebody do your job just lift up your hands and stretch it up before God hallelujah 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 somebody shout hallelujah Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's what Caleb, that's what Caleb means. That's what his name means. It had an audio and a visual, audio and a video component. The audio means that something is coming out of his mouth. The video component means there's a lifting up of the hands that people can see. Can you shout hallelujah? Hallelujah. Also, what's interesting about that word, yada, uh, Y-A-D-A-H, when you take the suffix off, which is the H, and then you just have yada, Y-A-D-A, that Hebrew word literally means to know. And, and that word know means know, knowing uh, intimately. It, it, it means a perception. And when I say no, it means like Adam knew his wife Eve. It, it, it means that, um, it means that uh, um, Abraham knew Sarah. It means that Isaac knew Rebecca. It means that Jacob, he knew Rachel. He knew Leah. Are, 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 you, getting, are you getting what I'm saying? It means that they, 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 knew, they knew them. There was an intimacy with them. And, and what I'm trying to say here is that the way these words, the way they work together, and what it says is that uh, when you know God, uh, when you lift your hands and when you bless God, uh, th there's an intimacy that you have with God. And that intimacy that you have with God, it gets you pregnant with promise and pregnant with purpose. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. In other words, what it implies is that when you lift up your hands and you start opening up your mouth, all of a sudden you start to get pregnant. There's an impregnation that begins to happen in your spirit. All of a sudden, where you were sick, now all of a sudden you believe that you're going to be healed. All of a sudden, when you are in poverty, you believe that you're going to be in prosperity because something is about to shift. All of a sudden, when you get to know know God. You open up your mouth because you begin to realize who God is. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. When I talk about, when I talk about yada, that's lifting up my hands. When I talk about yada, that means I know. But when I talk about yah, that's just Y-A-D. That means that God's hand, that's God's hand is over my life. Does anybody realize that God's hand is over your life? Some of us, we ought to thank God that we are not on a ventilator, that we 
have survived this pandemic, that we have survived without jobs, that we have survived when people had written us off. I want you to just go like this. God's hand is over my life. Would you just shout God's hand is over my life? That's why I'm here. It's no goodness of my own. It's just that God's hand is over my life. I'm talking about the hand of the Lord is over my life. That's why we are here. Can you shout hallelujah? I said, can you shout hallelujah? All of these, all of these, all of these words, all of these meanings from basically three words. But if you, I'm, this is where you got to go and get the old lexicon and start breaking, breaking this word down. Can you shout hallelujah? I want to talk to you about Caleb, but I'm going to finish. This is my last point. Caleb is not somebody that just arrived just now. He was there in the beginning. He came out of Egypt. He was there in the wilderness. He saw all of the miracles. He saw all of the signs. He saw all of the wonders that God did in Egypt. He saw all of the wonders that God did in the wilderness up to this time. This is two years that they've been in the wilderness. But it was only when a crisis emerged that all of a sudden we hear about this man Caleb. Joshua was the minister of Moses, but we need to consider Caleb because when the crisis occurred, when the children of Israel sent the 12 spies, Caleb was of the tribe of Judah. And Caleb said, God is able. He's able to deliver. If he delights in us, God is going to give us this land. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. I'm just telling you that some of you that have been sitting in the back, some of you that have been living in obscurity, God is getting ready to bring you to the forefront. Nobody knew who Caleb was. This is the first time we're hearing about Caleb. Oh, but from now on, we're going to start hearing about Caleb because Caleb was the one, even when after all of the caucuses fell in the wilderness, Caleb was the one who went to, he went to Joshua. Joshua, who was the leader, and he said, you know what Moses promised me when we were in the wilderness? You know that Moses said that this land is going to be mine and I'm going to possess it? The Bible says Joshua lifted up his hands and blessed him. You know, Caleb said Caleb was 85 years old, and Caleb said that the same strength that I had back then, I'm 85 years old now, is the same strength that I've got today. That can you, that's, the, that's a blessing, that's a miracle from God. The same strength that he had when he was 45 years old and went into the wilderness and went into the promised land. He's 85 years old and he's got the same strength. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. And these giants that all the children of Israel were scared of. Uh, hey, it was Caleb who said, uh, Joshua, give me that mountain. I know the giants are in there, but give me that mountain because if God is with me, uh, I'm going to get the mountain. If God is with me, we're going get the land if God is with me whatever I put my hand to do God is going to back me we got to remember Caleb Caleb went into that mountain destroyed all of those giants it became his possession this was Mount Hebron Mount Hebron and then all of a sudden when Caleb said if anybody goes down to get this land he said, I'll give you my daughter. It just so happened that his nephew, Othniel, went down to the land, captured the land, came back, and Caleb said, all right, I'm going to give you my daughter. His daughter said, Dad, you've given me the upper springs. You've given me the nether springs, but I want all of this land over here. I want you to give me all of that. You know what Caleb did? Caleb gave his daughter more than what she asked for. Because it all goes back, because the Bible says, and his seed shall possess it. That's a good father right there. A good father will leave an inheritance to his children and his children's children. Let's put our hands together and give God praise. Let's, let's put our hands together and give God a praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's put our hands together and give God a praise. The Bible says Caleb, he had another spirit. His spirit was so in tune to what God said 
that he did not allow anybody to contaminate, to discourage, and to turn his mind from faith to fear because he was so locked in to what God has said. And the days that we're living in now, we have to be locked in to what God has promised us and to what God said in his word. Somebody shout hallelujah. I said somebody ought to shout In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I pray right now, Father, that you would stretch forth your hands to heal, to deliver, and to set free. You said, whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So we bind everything that is not like you. We bind the spirit of depression. We bind the spirit of cancer. We bind the spirit of the devil. God is in charge. Holy Ghost, take control. Holy Ghost, comfort. Holy Ghost, come alongside.